Welcome to the China Desk Podcast, presented by the Federal Newswire, with your host, Steve Yates. Welcome to the China Desk Podcast, episode 15. I'm your host, Steve Yates, Senior Fellow at the America First Policy Institute and Chair of the China Policy Initiative. A reminder to our audience, for whom we are most grateful, viewers can watch the China Desk on YouTube or subscribe to hear all of our interviews on Apple, Google, Spotify, and most other podcast providers. You can always access podcasts at thefederalnewswire.com. My guest today is David Dollar. David is a senior fellow at the John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution and host of the Brookings trade podcast, Dollar and Cents. He previously served as U.S. Treasury's economic and financial emissary to China from 2009 to 2013 and at the World Bank for 20 years, including a tour of duty as country director for China and Mongolia. David, welcome to the China Desk. Let's jump in. Uh, as I shared at the in the pre-show, now, we always like to talk a little bit about how our guests have entered into this conversation we find ourselves in today. I imagine with a name like Dollar, you were somewhat destined to be a treasury official at some point in your life, but I don't know that you grew up imagining that you would be at a China center of the Brookings Institution. Uh, so if you wouldn't mind, share with us a little bit about how you ended up uh, studying the topics of China's economic policy and growth and those kinds of things that bring you to a conversation of China's economic policy today. Well, thank you very much, Steve. Really a great pleasure to join the podcast. And, and it's kind of fun to think back. I've really been working on and off uh, with China for 50, literally 50 years. Uh, I graduated from high school the spring that President Nixon made his famous trip to China, spring of 1972. So China was all over the news. And when I went to college, I started studying Chinese. Uh, I continued studying. I lived in Taiwan in 1975-76. So that's the first time I got to greater China. Uh, and without going into too much detail, I be ended up becoming an economist. Uh, and as I was teaching at UCLA in 1986, I had an opportunity to teach in China, in the mainland, an elite group of graduate students at the Chinese Academy of Social Science. That was 1986. Uh, and then I did a lot of work on Vietnam, frankly, for the World Bank. So I wasn't just a China guy, uh, but eventually the World Bank uh, dropped me into China to head up the program uh, from Beijing. Uh, and then when Obama was elected president, I just retired from the World Bank, but stayed in Beijing and represented the U.S. Treasury for four years. And after that, came back to Washington and joined the Brookings Institution. So, so I've worked on China in different capacities, as I said, literally for 50 years. Yeah, well, that arc of history uh, has had within it some pretty dramatic change. Uh, some of it probably was unimaginable when you first saw things on the ground in Asia. Uh, and uh, so I think it would be really interesting to hear a little bit about some of those first impressions. I mean, many people who are parachuted into the post-cultural revolution China uh, saw pictures of things, images of things that were real life. Uh, it was uh, wildly different than what they could have imagined. Uh, and then the whole arc of Deng Xiaoping coming into office the pivot away from Mao's approach to policy, uh, some pretty su significant pivot points in things. Uh, so without trying to swallow the whole elephant, let's talk a little bit about those early years and what you were seeing and kind of what the big pieces of the China economic model was, how the world, um, whether it was the U.S., but also sort of the free world was interacting with China's economy then. And to just put in perspective, since we're in a wildly different point today, what, you know, what was the sort of percentage footprint that China's economy had on the U.S., the global economy in these early times? This is a really important question, Steve. I think uh, from my own experience, I, I think the time I spent in Beijing in the mid 80s in China more generally, you know, gives me a somewhat unique perspective. Other, there are other Westerners, of course, who were involved at the time, but anyone involved at that point saw that China was extraordinarily poor and underdeveloped in the mid-1980s. Uh, 
and I, I can't exaggerate uh, how poor it was. Aside from my teaching, I had an opportunity to travel around remote parts of China by local bus uh, during 1986 and again in 1988. And I had a lot of remarkable experiences. You know, I remember a long, day-long bus ride talking to a middle-aged woman sitting next to me, and she was travel traveling village to village and, and just selling little, what I would call trinkets, you know, combs and and you know hair barrettes and simple things, uh, but anyway, she was so excited. You know, for for her, economic reform meant she could travel around, and it's all my my, as the Chinese say. You know, do buying and selling, uh, and, and a lot of the reform just really was taking away restrictions that had been in place under the planned system. You know, letting farmers grow what they want to grow and sell much of that output on a free market. Uh, so you suddenly have incentives to work harder and earn some money or travel around doing a little selling. And pretty soon we start getting people moving from the countryside to cities. I mean, just so much dynamism that was essentially opened up uh, by removing a lot of restrictions that had been in place about what people could do, what farmers could do, people moving, et cetera. So a lot of the reform was really just taking away a whole bunch of restrictions that were controlling people's lives. So is it is it fair to say that it was uh, you know this sort of beginnings of change and growth and some degree of openness was really undoing Maoism? Uh, I mean, there was uh, that period that uh, that we studied uh, about the dramatic policies that were put in place political, economic, and otherwise, whether it's the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, in, in many ways, coming out of that, you had a generation of people who sort of were fed up with politics. Uh, and uh, how could you have anything other than explosive growth after coming through periods of self-immolation as, as your economic policies? Now, I may overstate the case, so correct me uh, in, in that kind of framing, but simply it uh, wasn't really the opening of the Dung era, the undoing a lot of Maoism. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and I like to emphasize, you know, from we know from research that a lot of this bubbled up from below. You know, this wasn't just there was a change in leadership at the top and, and Deng Xiaoping and others came in with good new ideas. Uh, a lot of the reform bubbled up from below. The big reform in agriculture is just common sense, basically. They had these agricultural communes that were not very productive and they divided up the land and basically gave it back to family farmers uh, and they got an immediate 20 percent increase in rice production and a lot of that started at the local level people were were not just poor they were actually getting poorer during this some of that time you're talking about great leap forward cultural revolution and you start getting communities uh, that that chose to go down this path of breaking up the communes and restoring something close to private property rights uh, over agricultural land. And they got the kind of response you'd expect from economic theory. You know, they got yeah. a good response. And then I give Deng Xiaoping a lot of credit that seeing some of this bubble up from below, he then had the leadership end endorse this as a nationwide policy. So you then get important meeting and I think it was December 1978, where they endorsed this return to family farming, calling it the household responsibility system. So you're now responsible for your household. You're not just dependent on this commune where, where you work hard and not clear what kind of benefit you get from that. Uh, and then, of course, there were other parts of the reform outside of agriculture. But, but you do find that common thread that a lot of the reform was taking away restrictions and returning to pro, what I call private initiative. It may not have been exactly our private property rights, but it was a lot of space for private initiative. Well, and as part of that journey too, uh, and this is uh, where I think your experience and expertise adds important context and value, uh, is uh, a lot of uh, journalists and even experts in policy would look at this as kind of a singular story of here were policymakers in China that were changing the way the system might operate. Uh, and obviously it was going to be reacting to what was happening 
uh, among the people, local level, all the way up to the central level. But it really was a question of survival for that system coming out of those those dark years. They had to do something different to sustain leadership politically, but also the nation economically. Uh, and one of the institutions that played a larger than life role, in my estimation, it was part of my early study of things U.S.-China, was the World Bank. Uh, and uh, some people may forget what a lot of these major infrastructure projects were of the past. But if you go around to the, the major economic growth engines of China, I think you'd be hard pressed not to find significant infrastructure projects that were only made possible by multilateral lending institutions. Uh, that was a lot of American capital, but it was a lot of other uh, global capital that made that possible. Uh, share with us a little bit about that reform and opening through the 80s and arcing into the 90s experience, because uh, in, in my memory, through the 1990s, the World Bank was still a pretty major player in what was happening in infrastructure and development policy and projects in China. Well, Steve, I want to make clear that I was not personally involved in that early period, right. but I've studied it. and I At some point, you had to read about it. Yeah, and I have huge respect for the colleagues, the World Bank colleagues right. who carried that out. So a couple of points. Uh, so first, there was a famous trip by Robert McNamara, president of the World Bank. I think it was 1980. Uh, traveled around, and, you know, met Deng Xiaoping, uh, and Deng basically told him, that China was going to modernize and it was going to be successful and develop. It was going to do it with or without the World Bank, but it would do it faster with World Bank support. And McNamara was you know, the first World Bank president who really threw the institution's support behind the Chinese effort. And then there were so many different components of it, but I guess I would single out, there was quite a bit of, of help on the, what I would call macroeconomic policy. But I think the staff involved were very clever. They, they didn't go and try to lecture the Chinese, which is never going to be very successful. Uh, what they did is they organized a lot of different events where they would bring in successful policymakers from other countries. Because remember, China was quite isolated. You know, it didn't have particularly strong diplomatic relations with many, many countries around Asia. So the World Bank could play a useful role. Actually, the World Bank even brought in officials who'd been involved in the Taiwan miracle. That's the kind of thing the World Bank could do. They could have an academic seminar, uh, bring in a retired, renowned economist from Taiwan, uh, have that person just talk Chinese with the Chinese policymakers. So Taiwan basically invented the export-oriented development model. So that was a great lesson. Uh, but just more generally, you know, the, I think the World Bank facilitated contact between the Chinese policymakers and a lot of relevant ex different types of experts and experienced people around the world. Uh, and then there, there are a lot of uh, sp specific areas where I think the World Bank helped China. But one story I love to tell is that one of the first infrastructure projects the World Bank did there was a big port renovation, you know, and they needed to, as part of that, they needed to buy those giant cranes you see in ports, you know, that lift whole containers. And China wasn't making anything like that back in 1980. Uh, it, you know, that, that it was going to import that. And the World Bank procedures require international competitive bidding for any big purchase like that. And the Chinese were very reluctant. They, they just didn't, it was a strange animal for them. <laughs> but, but anyway, we did international competitive bidding, the staff at the time, not me. And uh, it, it ended up costing about 20% less than the experts had estimated based on going prices because you know, all the relevant firms wanted to get into China. So everybody wanted to win this contract. So they got some kind of European uh, contractor who won that bid, but the Chinese were really impressed. And then they ended up producing uh, domestic procurement laws uh, that included a lot of this element of competitive bidding, of, you know, in the, of validating who's a reliable supplier uh, and then having price competition to meet certain specifications. And then you pick the, you know, the lowest uh, credible bid. Uh, and so you actually have, you know, procedures like that that have a big effect that have been adopted in China because they were first done in a World Bank project. That's one little project. But then you develop the whole procurement system based on that. That has an enormous effect on the whole economy. So I think 
a lot of the effect of the World Bank is this kind of indirect, you know, stimulating <clears throat> larger change in China that goes well beyond any one project. Well, David, let's focus a little bit on that, uh, I think, really significant transition period, uh, ironically, sort of around the year 2000. Uh, we had, of course, around the world, though, the Y2K uh, flub that didn't really do much. And there's nothing magical about the year 2000 in any other way. But it really did seem to be a big transition point that is very different than what we perceive now. Uh, in that run up to 2000, uh, there was a very different mood in China uh, economically and politically. Uh, there was the travesty of Tiananmen that uh, the, the leadership was highly motivated to come back out from under sanctions and establish a very different path to rejoining the world and getting their economy on track. All those, all those things that seem to be, at least in my estimation, somewhat of a different conversation than we have today. Uh, I served in the in the Bush White House soon after that transition, and we had uh, different kinds of dialogue about the post WTO entry uh, uh, China and where things were going. Uh, but uh, we talked a little bit before about the manufacturing change uh, there by the 2000s and going forward. We had major American brands who were investing heavily. Uh, and China as a manufacturing platform. A lot of foreigners were spending a considerable amount of time living and working inside China. Uh, and so some of the after effects of reform and opening were changing some of the fundamentals about what it was like to be in China. Uh, even if you just took like the 1985 to 1990 period and you moved it into the 2001, 2005 period, uh, you, you had all the anecdotes of people wearing, you know, different colored clothes, different kinds of conversations, very modern cities uh, and transportation, other things. Give us a little color about uh, some of that uh, post 2000 China experience, which would include your time living there. Yeah, so definitely after China joined the WTO and, and it wasn't just that. I mean, there was also right pretty global boom going on. And China had done a lot of preparation before joining WTO. So they really took off uh, after 2000, 2001. I call this the golden age of Chinese growth from about 2000 to 2008. So the ex exports were going up rapidly. Foreign investors were coming in. Uh, the economy was doing well. People were getting richer. Housing market was taking off. So there was a very uh, ebullient mo uh, mood in China at that time. And I moved to Beijing in, in 2004 to head up the World Bank program, uh, which was no longer as important as in the early stage. You know, I'll just be frank about that. But uh, it gave me an opportunity to travel all around the country. And I brought my family to live in the suburbs of Beijing. And there was actually a very nice international community that had developed. Uh, and there were quite a few different international schools, a lot of interaction between the foreign community and, and at least middle-class Chinese and intellectuals. While I was working for the World Bank, I would routinely uh, you know, teach classes over at Tsinghua University. You know, I would just go over there and take over one of my friends, one of my Chinese professor friends you know, class for a for a day and then come back a couple months later and do another day. And, and I never really felt constrained uh, in what I would talk about. So there was a, a certain openness. I would, wouldn't want to exaggerate it, uh, but there was a certain openness at that point. A lot of, at least a lot of, you know, active discussion on the economic front, you know, mm -hmm. about where China should go next with economic reform. And, you know, I took over a World Bank program that had, was languishing a bit, frankly, because its role w was not really the same as it had been before. And the main focus I uh, put into the program was to try to help China with env environmental issues, which were really just taking off at that time. We did the first careful estimate of premature deaths from air pollution in China. And, you know, that was very controversial. And, and everything we did, you know, we had to discuss with the government and then get approval to publish. You know, that's how the World Bank operates. And I worked pretty hard to get that report published. And in the end, uh, 
because we did it together with Chinese scientists uh, and it was based on good science uh, that got published first, you know, credible estimates of premature deaths from air pollution. Uh, we did some similar things on water. Uh, so we did a lot of environmental things and it was a moment where you were starting to get non-government organizations organizing around environmental issues and also around AIDS. There were certain, there was a little bit of space for civil societies, how I would describe it, right? These were not political parties challenging the Communist Party of China, but there was a little bit of space for civil society. And, and that was extremely welcomed by the Chinese population. And it, it made it a nice place to live if you were a, a foreign expert at that point. Mm -hmm. So we're going to start pivoting a little bit more into the current period. Uh, I think all of the context is extremely helpful to try to understand what is happening now, what's different, uh, because in, in my estimation, there, there are some core lessons of what really worked in China through the reform and opening period and in this transition after joining the WTO and a lot of what you described as this a different modern life period in China. There's still people that live in poverty even today. Uh, and certainly there were in greater numbers even then, uh, 15 years ago. Uh, but uh, today we're dealing with, uh, it seems to me, a very different kind of government approach and ethos. Uh, and China's economy is in a very different place. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, you were at Treasury uh, or were part of the Treasury mission at a time where I think we started having a lot of questions about China's currency policy and is it a manipulator? Uh, and uh, there, there are sort of some early questions about uh, the basic bargain we had made, which was in some ways a concessionary approach to China to allow for growth into being a, uh, as Bob Zelik uh, tried to brand, a responsible stakeholder. Uh, but by the mid-2010s uh, or so, uh, we have Xi Jinping rising as a leader. Uh, we had uh, some changes in the global economic experience where people were questioning uh, the globalization of manufacturing and outsourcing of certain kinds of jobs. Uh, and I think the beginnings of the, uh, the questioning of the fundamentals of what had been uh, the U.S.-China bargain that was the bulwark over a lot of what we've talked about so far in our conversation. But really, it was in the Obama administration, I think, that a lot of these questions really started to get uh, acceleration. It's not so easy to pin it on why in different periods there's a financial crisis that affected everybody, and that makes people start to rethink things. Uh, I would argue that it actually does matter that Xi Jinping is a particular kind of leader of China and has some different priorities and different approaches that have manifested them, themselves in ways that are that are very different from Deng Xiaoping's biding time and hiding your capabilities, general uh, ethos that seemed to carry from Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao. Uh, Hu Jintao was the leader who came into power when I was in the White House, and he seemed to have all the charisma of a librarian. There was <laughs> there was nothing sort of interesting about him, which in, in some ways made him perfect for Chinese politics at that time. Uh, Xi Jinping is much more aggressive about planning personality uh, onto policies, uh, but uh, help us talk through on the economic tool sets, everything from currency to trade, uh, to sort of structure of the economy, the role foreigners uh, can and should play. I mean, really, the topic of decoupling began inside of China, in, in, in my experience. Uh, and the echo of it is taking place in the United States and elsewhere now. But uh, correct anything I've said that was wrong on that front, but jump in on how the structure of things today is really different than those decades that we witnessed and worked through prior. No, Steve, I think you basically got that right. Uh, you know, I left the World Bank and joined Treasury in 2009, you know, but I stayed in Beijing. I represented Treasury there. And I think the global financial crisis 
it was another important turning point for China. You know, up until that point, it, it was what I call the golden age of growth. They were, you know, we had we already discussed that, and then the global financial crisis was a big tub of cold water thrown all over that. You know, China's exports dropped like a stone. 30 million workers were thrown out of work quickly. I mean, it was an extraordinary crisis. Uh, and the government responded pretty effectively, uh, but with, with their favored tool, basically. You know, they responded with a lot of money put into public investment, uh, infrastructure projects run by local governments uh, and also state enterprises. So if you think of that, you know, 2000s is a period where the private sector was growing so rapidly that it was kind of taking over more and more of the economy. After 2009, you had the reversal. You had this big surge of state money uh, going into certain things. And then the private sector, you know, a lot of that was in retreat first, you know, because of the global cycle, basically, because of the global crisis. But also you start getting political change in the sense that you start getting some prominent Chinese entrepreneurs emerging as public figures in China. Uh, and a lot of them are, are in different aspects of the service sector, you know, so they're in social media or they're in alternative finance, uh, they're online tutoring, a, a whole range of service sector activities, all of which are sensitive in China, you know, finance, communication, media, all of that is sensitive. So I think you you get the Chinese leadership, you know, looking at the world and seeing that, well, globalization has a lot of shocks and unpleasantness. And then also seeing that this rise of the private sector is starting to create potential political competition with the leaders of the Communist Party. So, so I see Xi Jinping emerging, you know, from that leadership, uh, you know, I don't see that it's just Xi Jinping. I think it's not a coincidence that he was chosen uh, by his colleagues, essentially. He's a pretty colorless bureaucrat, uh, but I think he represents that elite level of the Chinese Communist Party pretty well. And they're, you know, they're afraid about power centers like the private sector, Chinese private sector developing too much. Uh, they're also worried about being too dependent on foreign technology. So you, know, you, you saw as their capabilities rose, they were doing a lot of things in terms of cyber theft and intellectual property rights violation. Uh, you, you get a somewhat successful China starting to really uh, rebel against some of the norms of international capitalism. Uh, and then you finally get some response from the United States in particular uh, reacting to that. So, you know, we, we've, we've gone through uh, a couple of cycles since, uh, you know, since back in 1972, when Nixon visited China, and we're, we're definitely now in a, you know, pretty bad cycle, pretty bad part of the cycle where, you know, we don't like a lot of what China's doing. China doesn't like a lot of what the United States is doing. Uh, these are two nuclear armed powers with enormous militaries and and so there are a lot of risks and worries. But meanwhile, we still have a very high degree of economic integration. So it's kind of a unique, yeah. it's definitely a unique situation. We didn't have that with the Soviet Union. We just had right. conflict, you know, and, and some detente because we didn't want to have, you know, mutual nuclear destruction. Uh, but with China, we have this extraordinary economic integration and we have a lot of the geopolitical tension on top of that. Yeah, so... With our remaining time, I want to slice a few of these different economic lanes uh, to try to digest a bit more. Uh, one is on, on currency. Uh, there's, this is a very, very different conversation from, from times past. Uh, we have talk about cryptocurrency or e-currency. Uh, there's this question of China trying to establish an alternative reserve uh, currency. Where do you sort of see the contours of this going? I mean, really, we're starting from a position where really it was almost uh, laughable to think of anything other than the U.S. dollar being uh, the reserve currency. And maybe there's so much uh, breadth and depth to that, that the, this is really marginal talk. But there's a lot of this marginal talk. So help help uh, put some expert depth into what people should understand and think about this issue of 
uh, the the yuan dominated denominated trade or e currencies and things like that within the Chinese system. So so here's my short history of the Chinese currency in modern times. Basically, yeah. the Communist Party leadership is very control oriented. So they want to control the exchange rate. They don't like the idea of a market moving the exchange rate around very much. Uh, and we've gone through a number of different periods. So this was an issue when I was working for Treasury. You know, when I first joined, I would say the Chinese currency was pretty seriously undervalued and it needed to rise. And they were reluctant to allow that to happen. But gradually over time, you know, there was a certain amount of appreciation. I, you know, I think they they missed the opportunity to really liberalize, but they allowed it to appreciate enough to bring down their overall trade balance as a share of GDP. So there was a little bit of policy success there. I like to joke, Steve, I'm still waiting for my bonus, you know, because, <laughs> uh, you know, we got pretty good movement during my four years at Treasury. But that, <laughs> that's just a coincidence. Uh, but now, you know, more recently, what we see is the market pushing their currency down. Uh, and so, you, you don't hear the U.S. side talking so much anymore about why don't you, you know, liberalize the exchange rate? Because right now, if they liberalized it, it's probably going to drop like a stone because uh, people are losing confidence. Chinese people are losing, losing confidence in their own system. They want to move money out of the country. So China has very strict capital controls limiting how much money you can take out of the country. And in that situation, I think most of the talk about the Chinese currency challenging the dollar is just nonsense, basically, mm -hmm. because, you know, you don't want to get paid in Chinese yuan. What are you going to do with it? It's not a convertible currency. You know, you get paid in dollars. You can buy a, you know, a 30 day treasury bill or you could buy a 60 day or 90 day, whatever you need. And then when you need to convert it, say, into euros 90 days from now, there's a deep market for that. Or you want to hedge, you can use the futures market to take any risk out of this. None of that exists in dealing with the Chinese currency. So I think the talk is really just talk. Just to throw out a couple numbers, less than 3% of trade settlement is in Chinese currency. And most of that I would call just political. You know, if Saudi Arabia essentially as a government sells a certain amount of oil to China, you know, they're willing to take some payment in renminbi knowing that, you know, they naturally, you know, buy a certain amount from China. You know, it's almost like barter trade, which is incredibly inefficient. Uh, but you don't see Saudi Arabia putting a lot of their extensive reserves into Chinese yuan because of the problems I mentioned. You can't move it in. There's no deep capital market. There's no reliable property rights there. Uh, so I think, you know, I think the dollar looks pretty solid, uh, you know, for the long term. But but of course, we do have to preserve that, you know, and yeah. That involves topics we can't get into, but we've got to get our fiscal house in order. And obviously we're bringing inflation down. People still have a lot of confidence in the U.S. dollar. Uh, and I think that that's kind of self-fulfilling. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the last thing I would say on this is if China made the kind of changes that necessary to boost its currency, like opening the capital account, having deeper, more transparent capital markets, futures markets, these kind of things, we should welcome that, you know, because mm -hmm. that would be, uh, you know, a, an improvement for the whole world financial system. Uh, I'm not worried about the dollar competing against the Chinese yuan, but in the short run, it's it's not a serious competition because of the, all their restrictions. Uh, and if they want to remove some of that, that would be fine with me. But I, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah. Well, an, another trend that has uh, popped into a lot of business news discourse is the emergence of a sizable property bubble inside of China. Uh, there's the, uh, the, the very large development companies uh, that uh, there are videos of entire high rises being demolished. It's a, a, a compelling visual. Uh, it's hard to tell what is anecdotal and what is more systematic and widespread. Uh, but there's been enough coverage inside and outside of China that I tend to see this as a very real consideration in trying to assess the health uh, 
of the Chinese economy and any risk that is over the horizon. And that could have political and strategic consequences as much as economic consequences. Uh, But what's the reality check on this property bubble conversation that comes up? Right. So I think the main problem there is what I call the real problem, that they've overbuilt the housing stock. Actually, there's a lot of ironies in China. They've probably underbuilt the housing stock in their key cities like Beijing and Shanghai, but they don't let people move there very freely. Uh, Mm -hmm. If they opened up mobility, uh, there'd probably be a lot more space for construction in those tier one cities. But they've overbuilt certainly tier three, tier four cities. You know, there's more than 100 cities in China with more than a million people. So there are a lot of cities and there's been big construction booms in almost all of them. And in many cases, you know, nobody's coming to live there. You know, it's it's not attractive. There are no jobs. Uh, So there's a real problem. Uh, And then the developers who mostly it's private developers who build these things, uh, you know, some of them are clearly in trouble. We've had a couple of essential bankruptcies. But I think because of their control orientation, I think the leadership can prevent a financial crisis, uh, but what you get instead is what I call a kind of a growth crisis. It's just not going to be a dynamic part of the economy. It was as much as 25% of the economy going into building housing and things closely associated. Uh, So that's a pretty big part of your GDP that's now, actually it was first half of the year was down 20% uh, housing investment over the past year. So you take a big chunk of your economy and you get negative 20 uh, and then nothing else you can do is going to get you to a healthy positive number. And, you know, that's why their economy right now looks like it's growing at about 3%. uh, And that's a lot of that's just dragged down by the real estate sector. So I would expect the drag on growth to continue, but I would be surprised if there were a big visible financial crisis as we've seen in in more genuinely capitalist economies. Mm -hmm. Well, the other big trend that uh, I know that you've expressed some some views and analysis on is demographics and population. Uh, And, uh, you know, I I want to go through this before we start talking uh, in our wrap segment about what kinds of consequences there are for a policy engagement or uh, what's happening in the world, given some of these changes. I mean, we've pivoted from this borderline international miracle experiment of coming out of the clutches of Maoism into something very, very different, much more integrated into the world, decades of double digit growth that was fantastical and lured everybody in. And now we have some people looking for the exits. Uh, We have capital looking for the exits in some cases. Uh, And I think that there's there are profound strategic consequences to these demographic trends too, uh, making the economic model that we saw in the 80s, 90s and 2000s not even feasible to be practiced in the coming decade or two, much less beyond. Uh, but give a little bit of a reality check on the arc of this demographic change and what it means for the economy as a strategic part of China. Yeah, no, this is a great question, Steve. So that dynamic period we were talking about, the urban prime age working population went from 100 million to 400 million, you know, over a couple of decades, but still, I mean, that's an, you know, that's an extraordinary increase. And so that, that's an important part of the whole story, you know, foreign investment, foreign trade, but you, you know, you need workers uh, and they had a pretty endless supply of people with good basic education many of whom came from the countryside to the city. So you could get that extraordinary increase I mentioned. Uh, But that just comes to an end right now, basically. You know, that urban prime age population, it's actually going to be stable for a little while if they allow some continuing migration from the countryside to the city. But before too long, it's going to start declining pretty sharply. And we don't really have any good examples of economies growing well once that prime working age population starts to decline. You know? And of course, people are living longer there, which is wonderful in a lot of ways, uh, but it's going to be an economic burden, you know, taking care of all of the elderly with this diminishing workforce. So, you know, there's still 
I like to end up in the middle in a lot of these discussions on Chinese growth. There's still a lot of positives in China. And if they would do certain reforms, like, as I said, uh, if they allowed people to move to the tier one cities, which are the most productive, uh, you know, and there's certainly more things they can do in terms of opening up foreign trade and investment still. And they, to be fair, they've signed a big trade agreement, you know, with ASEAN, the Southeast Asian countries and Japan, South Korea. You know, if they would pursue more openness, allow more mobility, uh, I would say, you know, get, get away from this focus on state enterprises and respecting once again the private sector. I mean, it's a pretty radical agenda in right now in China, but there it's is- It's radical a, in China. Yeah, it's there, it's yeah, pretty yeah, common yeah, everywhere else. Yeah, but there is a policy agenda that would certainly get them to a good, healthy, you know, a good, healthy growth rate around 5%. You know, and of course, once your population is not increasing, you know, 5% means 5% per capita. Uh, and that's pretty good in, in a world where- I mean, the U.S., we're probably going to be growing at about 1.7. So I think there's still a good chance China ends up as the biggest economy in the world. uh, But it's just it's just not going to be growing in the spectacular way we saw in the past. Is it really possible for them to even get to that mid-level growth and sustain it if they don't open up? to migration from outside of China. I mean, we, with the two generations of a one-child policy, not only do you have a change in numbers, but you have a change in quality of life and expectations for these little emperors who have two parents and four grandparents who have vested all of their hopes, dreams, and investment in them. And they might want to shop for Gucci or go travel to Paris. Uh, they're not necessarily prime candidates to build batteries and assemble phones and, and things like that. Uh, and uh, so I, I don't want to overstate the demographics of that change, but I think it's a very real consideration that even with the change numbers, the taste preferences and expectations of that remaining working age demographic are very different than what they were even just 10, much less 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, I think all the big economies, including the United States, need immigration in order to grow healthily. And I just don't see China as very welcoming to immigrants. Right. They may have a declining workforce, but it has a huge population and you know a lot of barren land out in the West. So if you really look at where people live, it's very densely populated uh, and it's pretty homogeneous, closed kind of society. So I think it's going to be hard for China to welcome immigrants. It's a huge advantage. I, my last podcast I did, I co- called the uh, immigration into the U.S. our superpower. Uh, mm. And if we could just rationalize our policies, um, you know, we could get a steady flow of immigrants, many of whom are skilled and entrepreneurial. Uh, and uh, it's our superpower, basically. And I just don't see how China can compete with that. Well, it certainly doesn't seem to be a conversation that's happening inside China. If, if, it, if it's happening, it's not in a uh, visible or verifiable discourse that uh, that foreigners are actively participating in, as best I can tell. Well, let's come to the point where we talk a little bit about what all of this means for how our countries are dealing with each other and the policies that we are pursuing. Uh, there uh, is, I think, a growing conversation in the United States uh, about strategic decoupling, uh, it is uh, it is it isn't the simple on-off switch of are we going to have all trade coming from China or no trade coming from China? It's more of uh, a question of how do we manage uh, dependency levels and are there certain categories of goods that uh, maybe need to be diversified? We can't overly depend upon uh, one of the short list of countries with whom we might have a conflict in the not too distant future. Uh, So uh, the supply chains and this whole discourse about some form of uh, whatever people want to call it by de-risking, strategic decoupling, what have you, there's clearly something there in the discourse. I don't think it's ungrounded from reality, but it's hard to tell where it might be going. Uh, But the other conversation point uh, 
that I want to get your your views on is uh, one that I see emerging about reciprocity. This this whole notion of what we are not allowed to do in China, they should not be able to do here in the United States, and it it affects what our approach might be to capital markets and access and regulation to land and ag land and other kinds of things. But these two broad things uh, I'd like I'd like to jump into before we wind down of what you know what you see as this discourse of strategic decoupling, which I would again wager. Uh, there's a there's a pretty deep reservoir of that conversation taking place from the Chinese side, uh, but from our uh, community in the United States, the supply chains decoupling and then this notion of some rebalancing in the direction of reciprocity. What do you make of those as concepts going forward here? Yeah, so I, I like the concept of a small yard with a high fence. Uh, but it is something that's easy to say and hard to actually implement, trying to figure out, you know, what goes in the small yard or how do you keep the yard small? I think what's helpful from, from my point of view, I think what's helpful is to recognize that most of our important partners are more deeply integrated with China than we are. You know, countries like Germany and certainly Japan, South Korea, Australia, some of our Southeast Asian friends, you know, they're all more deeply integrated with China. So we have to bring them along. And I think we have some good recent examples. Uh, but I, I think if we get out ahead of our partners, uh, we're mostly going to be hurting ourselves. You know, an example would be electric vehicles, where the Europeans are welcoming Chinese. Uh, the Chinese are now out ahead in the EV technology, frankly, and especially the batteries. So the Europeans are welcoming Chinese investment into Europe in battery plants and EV assembly. And you're going to get integrated European Chinese production that's very low cost. Uh, and we, frankly, are going to probably end up with very high cost electric vehicle production because we're going to insist on almost all of it being produced in North America. Uh, and that's not a particularly efficient way of doing things. So, so I'm a strong defender of national security. Uh, you know, I think we need to defend and we need to define the important areas you know, where we want to make sure we're not dependent on anyone who may become an adversary. Uh, but I think the danger is we extend it too far. You know, if we start defining something as, a, as an economic interest, uh, I mean, I think our economic interest is to, you know, have the economy grow and for people to be more prosperous. So I guess I'm a little worried about the protectionist trend we see in the U.S. and that we've taken this a little bit too far. The reciprocity uh, I've definitely used that language in it, and it sounds good, but I do think we have to look at each issue carefully. Um, so, for example, I think we benefit from having 300,000 Chinese college students in the United States. There's some risks, but I think the benefits outweigh the risks. Uh, now, I'm, I'm not sure there's any specific policy issue that's a problem, but just hypothetically, you know, suppose it were difficult for American students to go study in China. I wouldn't want to change our education policies because of what China is doing. Uh, so I think we have to kind of look, you know, uh, we, you know, we need to use a surgical knife on this uh, rather than a sledgehammer uh, in figuring out where we want to reciprocate. Mm -hmm. And on the land issues, it's getting a lot of conversation. Uh, uh, you've been there. Uh, uh, Americans obviously cannot freely buy land in China and use it as they as they choose. Uh, how, how should people understand and think about that? Yeah, to be honest, I don't have a strong view on that. I mean, it's definitely something to worry about. Um, there are quite a few countries that restrict foreigners' ability to buy agricultural land. Uh, so I guess I'm, I guess I'm open to looking at that. Uh, I, I'm a little bit skeptical. It's really a national security interest, recognizing that if we really had a conflict with China, you know, the fact that a farm was owned by the Chinese, some Chinese company, that's not going to make any difference. We're just we're just going to expropriate that in a war situation. You know, so I, I I don't see the China buying up our agricultural land uh, in a way that that threatens our food supply. But, but I understand it's a sensitive issue, and uh, I don't think I'd go to the mat on that one. Mm -hmm. Well, as we come, come to a conclusion, uh, I, I want to thank you, David, for 
all that you were willing to share on experience. You've had quite an arc of experience uh, in dealing with China and watching the developments there. Uh, I think it adds a lot to the context of our conversations here at the China Desk. But uh, for our uh, audience, those who want to follow your commentary and publications, uh, where would you like to point them to be able to follow your work? Well, I have a Twitter account at David R. Dollar. The R is important. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. And I host the Brookings Trade Podcast, Dollar and Cents. And I have a personal page on the Brookings website, brookings.edu. You can find me there and find my podcast. But mostly I do something, I put it out there on Twitter so people can have access to it. Excellent. Well, to our audience, if you enjoyed today's China Desk conversation, please tell your friends and consider subscribing on YouTube or your preferred podcast platform. Thank you very much for joining. And thank you to David Dollar for sharing his perspective. Until next time, I'm Steve Yates here at the China Desk. Thank you for listening to the China Desk podcast, presented by the Federal Newswire and hosted by Steve Yates. Check out the Federal Newswire's family of websites, as well as their social media stream. 